On the 5th of July, 1996, a man walking the streets of Jakarta, Indonesia, made a horrific discovery. It was the remains of a young male, at least what was left of him. What the man saw was far more brutal and disturbing than any words could adequately describe. But it did expose a chilling truth. A predator of the highest order was targeting the young homeless people. This is a descent into the very depths of human depravity. Ultimately, Robert Geddeck's killing spree will come to symbolize one of the most disturbing and horrific chapters in Indonesia's criminal history. This case stands out as exceptionally brutal and horrific. It's one of the most distressing I have encountered. Gedek is vile, and those who suffered at his hands are some of the most vulnerable people in society. This case is not very well known, and images are hard to find, but I've done my best to visually tell you this story. But before we dive in, I want to let you know that I make videos weekly, so if you want to see my next one, please drop the video a like and subscribe if you are new. It really helps me out. Thank you. When police arrived at the scene, they found a body which was so brutalized that it turned the stomachs of even the most experienced officers. The limbs were still attached to the body, but the torso itself had been slashed open from the chin to the belly button. This left the chest cavity and everything inside it exposed to the outside world, except there was nothing inside it to expose. All of the internal organs had been removed and just a dark cavernous hole remained. Even more disturbing was the fact that the victim was a young male and to make matters even more unsettling, this victim was not the first who had been discovered on the streets of Jakarta in such a terrible condition. At least 10 males had been found with their stomachs slashed open in less than two years. This discovery confirmed what people living on the streets already knew. There was a serial killer on the loose. A few days later, the police offered up the name of their only suspect, Siswanto Siswanto, also known as Robert Gedek. There isn't much information about the man, suspected to be Indonesia's most vile serial killer, but this is what I've been able to piece together. Gadek was born in 1963 in Pekalongan, Java, Indonesia, where he was thrust into a life marked by profound poverty and relentless hardship. Each day was a gruelling battle for survival. Education remained an unattainable dream for Gadek, as he couldn't afford to attend school. He remained illiterate for his entire life. He found himself virtually homeless at a tender age, a fate shared by many young people from impoverished families in the area. As he transitioned into his early teens, Gadek's existence was defined by a life on the streets where he foraged for food in garbage cans. Over time, he discovered that the most viable means of earning money was to collect and recycle plastic from the rubbish, a meagre source of income that sustained him. Amidst the harsh realities of life in Pekalongan, persistent rumors reached his ears, promising an easier path to prosperity in the bustling city of Jakarta. Driven by the hardships of his hometown, Gadek embarked on a journey to Jakarta in pursuit of a brighter future. Upon arriving, Gadek found himself engulfed in a bewildering world. The vastness of the city 
left him with questions about where to seek shelter and how to navigate this unfamiliar terrain. It was a blank canvas of uncertainty until fate intervened. One day, Gaddock encountered what he came to refer to as his adoptive mother. She embodied a unique model of motherhood, one centered around gathering numerous young people for the purpose of begging, a means of survival for her, as unconventional as it may sound. This adoptive mother resided on the outskirts of the bustling Gaplock, a market in Jakarta, dwelling in a place characterized by its stark inadequacy. Her home, a shelter that barely offered protection from the elements. In this unconventional family, Gadek was not alone. Among others, he shared this unorthodox household. They were bonded together by a pursuit of survival amidst the harsh realities of life on Jakarta's streets. Gadek's life was marked by physical abnormalities from an early age. Throughout his childhood and into his teenage years, his body faced a unique challenge. It simply couldn't grow as it should. Gaddock remained shorter in stature and hunchbacked compared to his peers. Additionally, he grappled with a condition that caused his head to involuntarily shake, earning him the nickname Gaddock, which stemmed from the repetitive shaking akin to the onomatopoeic sound Gadek Gadek. The meaning of this is lost in translation to English. As he reached adolescence, Gadek grappled with his attraction to males. However, the harsh reality was that despite the presence of other young street people who were predominantly female, he found himself facing rejection due to his physical stature this isolation and lack of acceptance left him longing for companionship. Over time, this longing turned into a sick desire for young males. Then, in 1994, Gedek picked up another hobby, murder. He used his new name, Robert Gedek, as an alter ego to present himself as a nurturing father figure to the young people on the street. It was the kind of character that many of them had never experienced, but were innately drawn to. At night, Gaddock would troll the streets of Jakarta and Pekalongan in search for vulnerable young males who were innocent enough to fall for his act. Then he would entice them into his house offering them food, something they always wanted. And on top of this, he offered them safety and a sense of belonging. Once they were inside his house and relaxed, he would force himself on them. When it was over, Gadek strangled them to death with a rope. Then he took a sharp knife and slashed open their stomachs. He would drink the blood of his victims. He did this as he believed it made him strong. He felt reinvigorated after doing so. And sometimes, Gadek removed sections of the victim's skin to keep as a memento. After this, he would chop the bodies into small pieces. He would dump their remains back onto the streets where he had found them. Gadek was doing this from 1994 to 1996. A long time to be getting away with such horrific crimes. Officers and locals alike knew that there was a killer amongst them, but no one had any clues as to who it may be. The remains of the young street people were so small that it was all but impossible to identify them. But one day, in 1996, a bag was found not far from a victim's remains. It was a backpack, and inside there was books. The books were all inscribed with the name Sikin. The police launched an extensive investigation in the vicinity of the incident, 
focusing their initial efforts on the local residents. With having a name of who they believe was a victim, the first line of inquiry naturally led them to people living in the area. They meticulously questioned each resident, but the results were inconclusive. No one had any knowledge or information about the person named Sikkin. By chance, they encountered one young individual who happened to know Sikkin. That's when things began to take shape. This person recognized Sikkin as a homeless friend, someone who begged for a living and roamed the streets aimlessly. This revelation prompted the officers to shift their focus towards the homeless population. In the impoverished neighborhood, they diligently interviewed each young homeless person, trying to piece together the events leading up to Sikkin's tragic demise. Their investigation led them to the name Robert Gedek, someone who was considered a leader amongst the homeless, or at least held a position of influence. However, the police were reluctant to act, as some of the young homeless people claimed that Robert Gedek, due to his physical limitations, seemed unlikely to have committed such a heinous act. This changed, however, when another young homeless person claimed that he had last seen Sikkin with Gadek just days before his death. This changed things for the authorities, as now they had an eyewitness. The police acted swiftly, determined to locate Robert Gedek's residence. They managed to uncover his address, which turned out to be at his adoptive mother's house. Without hesitation, the police embarked on a journey to central Yava, following information provided by Gedek's adopted mother. They learned that he was in Teagle, not his hometown of Peklongan. Upon reaching Teagle, the police encountered Gedek at the train station. He was begging, accompanied by two young street people, one on his left and one on his right. These young people were potential victims, and had it not been for the timely intervention from the police, their fate may have been as grim as Sikkin's. Remarkably, the police walked past Gedek multiple times at the station. Without realizing they were hunting him, he remained relaxed until the moment police confronted him. As he stood up, the officers noted his short stature, his distinctive limp, and the involuntary shaking of his head. These unique characteristics instantly identified Gedek, and he was immediately arrested. With a sense of urgency, the police interrogated him, demanding answers about his victims and their identities. However, Robert Gedek remained defiantly silent, refusing to disclose any information. Before he would talk, he demanded food and cigarettes. Once the officers obliged, he started to speak. Gedek admitted that he had been the one to force himself, murder and disembowel the young males. He said he killed them to make sure they couldn't tell anyone about what he was doing to them and he added that he particularly enjoyed drinking his victim's blood. But right after admitting what he had done, he claimed that he didn't want to kill the males, and that he only did it because a man named Bam Bang told him to do it. It's impossible to say exactly how many young people get slaughtered during an 18 month period between 1994 and 1996. At least 12 young males were found on the streets of Jakarta with similar injuries. Gadok only ever admitted to carrying out 12 murders, but officers believe the number is closer to 20. After Gadok's confession, he was charged with 12 counts of murder. During his trial, 
The defense argued that he didn't want to kill the males and that he thought that they were chickens. They also doubled down on the claim that he had no choice because someone else was making him do it and that because he was mentally unstable, he was easy to manipulate. They stated, Robert's mental health and intellectual ability should be seriously considered here because the defendant always agreed to anything he was told and could not state an opinion. But the prosecutor claimed that the opposite was true. They pointed to the fact that Gaddock's own defense lawyers had asked for a psychiatric evaluation to be carried out, but they had withdrawn their request when they decided that he was, and quote, sane enough. They also shared evidence of their failed attempts to track down the man Gaddock said was making him carry out the murders, Bam Bang, who has never been identified. Throughout the trial, Gaddock sat in the dock wearing a white shirt and black pants. His face showed no expression, even when extremely graphic evidence was being presented in court. It was this lack of visible remorse which led prosecutors to demand that he be sentenced to death for the murders. Not because the crimes were so brutal, but because he didn't look like he regretted what he had done. In 1997, one year after his final victim was discovered, Gaddock was sentenced to death for the murder of 12 young males. Ten years later, on March 26, 2007, when Gaddock was waiting execution in prison on Kambangan Island in Indonesia, he had a heart attack and died. In a chilling twist, in 2010, another serial killer known by the name of Babe was arrested in Jakarta. Just like Gaddock, he admitted that he forced himself murdered and mutilated at least 14 young males from the street. He also decapitated a number of his victims. Babe took responsibility for his crime and said that he only killed them because they refused to willingly be intimate with him. Somehow, the story gets worse. Babe admitted that he and Gaddock were actually friends and that they had lived in the same area during the period of time Gadek was active. Many people believe that Babe was a witness in Gadek's trial and that he provided testimony in order to deflect attention away from his own killings. The authorities have denied that Babe testified during the trial, but they haven't been able to disprove the relationship between the two killers. Babe was later sentenced to death for the murder of 14 young males. He remains alive in prison. Babe and Gadek's association begs the question, were all 12 murders associated with Gadek really all his own doing? Or was Babe responsible for some? Or even worse, were they working together? Thank you for watching. Until next time. Stay sane.